Hi everybody, welcome to part 11 of the Bravo project. Today we'll be working on our UART module, which uh, consists of two parts. It's called um, URTX and UART RX. Essentially, this is the module that connects our computer uh, Bravo to, let's say, a PC or a Mac or even a Linux machine so that we could have input and output uh, to Bravo. Uh, so this module um, also have a USB to serial adapter here, as you can see, that actually have a USB port that we could use to um, connect um, Bravo computer to our computer or to a PC, let's say. Now, let's uh, have a look at a couple of slides and review the fundamentals of UART. And then we're gonna look at the um, circuit logic behind the TX module. Uh, and then we're going to build the whole uh, module, including the TX and RX uh, part. But uh, in this video, we're going to focus on the uh, TX module and we're going to basically test it and see how we could send out data uh, from Bravo uh, to the terminal. All right, with that, let's get started. All right, so let's say what is our goal here. Well, simply our goal here is really to be able to send and receive data to Bravo uh, from a computer, let's say uh, a PC or a Mac or a Linux machine. And essentially what we want to do is to use the uh, PC's keyboard to you know, input some information and that data should be transferred to Bravo. And also when Bravo actually does some operation and have some output, that output should be sent to the PC's monitor. Now, in order to do that, we'll be using uh, a protocol called UART and also a terminal emulator program such as TerraTerm, Putty, uh, etc. So let's have a look at uh, UART and see what is UART. So UART is a universal synchronous receive and transmit protocol. And essentially, it's a protocol or set of rules to um, exchange data between two devices. Now, in our case, uh, one device would be the Bravo and the other device would be a PC. Now, something that I would like you to pay attention here is that uh, a synchronous word. And that basically means that these two systems that are trying to communicate uh, through the serial line have their own independent clock and their clock is not synchronized. So let's say that you have a computer, uh, a PC that is running at uh, 3.2 gigahertz. So it has its own internal clock and it's running. And of course we have uh, Bravo on the other side, which is running at let's say 3.68 megahertz and it has its own uh, internal clock, which is running. As you can see, those clocks are not connected to each other and has nothing to do with each other. Uh, therefore, they are, uh, we call the system synchronous, meaning that uh, the clocks are not synced across these, uh, uh, you know, communication channel. Now, the other thing uh, which is important about the UART is that UART is a serial communication protocol, meaning that we are only having two lines to transfer data. Uh, if you think about Bravo, we actually um, represent data normally in a parallel format. For example, on the bus lines, we have, uh, you know, eight bus lines and we could represent eight bits in those. Uh, however, when we want to actually send or receive data, then we have to somehow, uh, you know, change that uh, parallel data to a serial because we're going to have uh, only one line, uh, essentially, which we need to, let's say, transmit data to the other side. Now, um, also you see uh, on the screen that we actually have a USB to uh, serial adapter here. And the reason for that is most of the modern computers doesn't actually have a, a COM port or what they call it, a serial port at the back of them or on the motherboard. In the past, uh, there was a COM port on the back of the computers and you could actually connect a serial device directly to the computer. But these days, um, the only port that uh, probably you can find on the modern computer is a, a USB port. And that's why we need this uh, adapter here, essentially, which gives us a USB on one side that uh, could connect directly to our computer. And the other side uh, uh, give us a couple of uh, pins, uh, which essentially are the serial communication pins that we need uh, for uh, serial communication between these two devices. Now, those pins um, are normally RX, uh, TX, uh, ground, and 5 volt. And uh, these are normally uh, the pins that you find on these adapters. Uh, so the 5 volt and ground are uh, quite clear. Uh, now, with 
any UART communication, you want to make sure that the devices are connected to the same ground. And uh, this is uh, the same here. So the ground from Bravo should be connected to the ground and this uh, serial adapter. And essentially that ground is also connected to the ground and the computer. The other cool thing about this uh, USB to serial adapter is that it's actually outputting a five volt. So that's, uh, that, that's quite good because we could use uh, that five volt to power up the computer. And in fact, this is gonna be the main power source for our computer once uh, we built everything and uh, we connected the, you know, the computer to our PC, then this adapter is actually outputting five volt and that's gonna be the main source for Rav project. Uh, so that's a five volt. Now, what remains is really the RX and TX lines and uh, the TX line is the transmit line. Whenever we want to send data, we're gonna put it on the uh, transmit line. And the RX line is the receive line. Whenever we want to receive data, uh, we're gonna basically check the RX line and uh, you know, put together the data which we receive on, uh, on the RX line. However, as you can see here, those uh, lines are actually crossed between the devices. That means that uh, the TX line from one side goes to the RX on the other side and vice versa. And I guess that's uh, quite uh, simple, right? Because we when we send the data through TX, we want that data to be landed on the receive side of the other side. And also when from the Bravo side, we send the data, we want to actually that data to be received on the receive side on, uh, on the PC. So I guess uh, this part is quite clear. And uh, the only thing that remains here is that um, this uh, USB to serial adapter is actually uh, integrated into uh, the UART module or UART board in uh, Bravo project. Um, here, just for clarification purposes, um, I, sh I showed it as a you know separate image. Otherwise, you see that uh, this little module is actually mounted directly on the on the project. All right. So, in order to actually implement the uh, UART uh, in Bravo project, we have a couple of challenges, or there are a couple of things that we need to do that we are going to look at them quickly here. Now, the first challenge is uh, converting that uh, parallel data to a, a serial data, right? So again, as I said, in uh, Bravo, we have data on the bus lines, which uh, basically uh, represent the bits uh, for a specific byte. Let's say that we are uh, sending letter A or capital A from Bravo uh, to the PC. Now, inside Bravo, we know that we have a bus and it has eight lines. And if you want to actually output, uh, let's say character A, uh, we're going to output 01000001, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which essentially is just a representation of uh, character A. Uh, and this is more about ASCII codes and so on. We're going to look at it uh, in one of the later slides. But uh, for now, let's say that uh, this byte is actually represent character A. And that's gonna show up uh, one bit per bus line in our Bravo uh, project, right? So now, if you wanna send that uh, in a serial fashion to the other side, what we need to do is take each of those bits one by one, starting from the least significant bit. And with each clock pulse, we're gonna put them on the TX line. So let's say first clock pulse, we're gonna put the zero. With the next clock pulse, we're gonna put one and so on. So this way, we're going to put those bits one by one on the TX line and basically the other side, uh, which is the uh, computer side, receives those on its receive line or RX line. And essentially what it does, it's going to check that line continuously and read those bits one by one and again kind of assemble them together and basically makes the byte again uh, on the PC side. Now, we don't have to be worried about the PC side because this is happening inside the PC. Uh, what we really need to be worried about is uh, the Bravo side. And when we are sending those bits uh, one by one on the line, the way that we do it is uh, for every bit which is uh, set to zero, we essentially bring the line low. And uh, for every bit which is one and we're trying to send it on the serial line, we pull the uh, TX line to high. So this way uh, we basically you know, send zero and ones on the line and therefore the other side would be able to detect um, those bits and, and put them together and assemble them together to uh, you, you know, make, the, make the same uh, basically byte uh, on its side. So this is actually done through a, uh, a couple of chips on Bravo side that we're gonna look at uh, them today uh, in the circuit logic. 
And we're going to see how that parallel to uh, serial, uh, basically, conversion is happening inside Bravo. So with that being taken care of, uh, the second part is actually the timing and the speed. Now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, when we are sending those bits on the line, we need a clock pulse. Uh, so that means that with each bit, we need to actually pulse the clock. Uh, however, uh, if you also remember from uh, the previous slides, I said that the clocks between these two devices are not synchronized, meaning that they are not running at the same speed. So that's going to be a problem. Why? Because uh, if one side is, let's say, sending uh, at a sending data at a specific speed, let's say the Bravo is sending five bits per second, uh, there is no way for the PC to uh, to know what speeds actually is the data is um, received on uh, on its side. Meaning that because they and uh, the clocks between those devices are not synchronized, they have no idea at what speed that data actually is sent. Uh, therefore, we need to come up with a solution uh, to come up with a common clock or common speed uh, between these two devices so that they could exchange the data at a predefined speed. And that's where the bot rate uh, comes into play. So UART standard by default supports specific uh, speeds. And basically when you actually um, install, let's say, a UART application in your computer, you could set the specific speeds that you want to send and receive data. And the bot rates are essentially just uh, bits per second. So for example, if we say we're gonna have a bot rate of uh, 4,800, that means that we are uh, you know, sending 4,800 bits per second on the line. Now, as you can see here, uh, the uh, Bravo clock speeds that we talked about uh, previously when we were building the clock module, are much higher than the uh, standard uh, you know, speeds that are supported by UART. Therefore, we have to actually uh, somehow change those speeds to a lower speed uh, so that we could match uh, you know, the standard bot rates that are available uh, for UART communication. Now, going back to the uh, clock module, if you haven't watched that video, I will uh, recommend that you go back and watch the uh, clock module video. Uh, and I've talked about the fact that we have a crystal oscillator running at uh, 3.68 megahertz. And that oscillator is actually outputting the clock to uh, another chip, which is a 74HC161 that we use it as a clock divider. And if you remember, we had a set of pins there that we could actually, using a jumper cap, change the output uh, clock that goes into computer using those, uh, those jumpers. So, for example, if we shorted the first set of pins on this uh, clock selector, we were actually uh, outputting the uh, original clock uh, from the oscillator, which was uh, 3.6864 megahertz. However, if we have shorted the next set of pins, which was uh, slash 2, that would actually divide the uh, 3.6864 by 2, and therefore our clock speed for the computer would be 1.84 megahertz. Uh, and so on. So depending on the you know, set of pins that you select uh, on that uh, clock rate selector, we could have different uh, clock speeds output from our clock module. Now, that speed that is actually outputting from clock module will be the main clock speed for the whole computer. Uh, however, as I said, uh, here we have an exception for UART, we need to actually go to much lower speeds. Therefore, we actually have to divide that clock even more uh, to come up with uh, lower speeds. So for example, if we run the clock speed on the clock module at 1.84, by dividing that by 16, which we're going to talk about a little circuit that actually does that, uh, we uh, come up with uh, uh, 115k baud rate, which is uh, perfect because this is a standard baud rate in UART communication. And what we could do, we could set the speed on the uh, PC side. And also we could, you know, select that uh, specific speed using this, um, you know, clock rate selector here on a clock module. And therefore we are uh, having a matching speed um, uh, from our UART module uh, in Bravo uh, uh, to the computer. So that's how we match the speeds between uh, Bravo and uh, the computer for UART communication. But again, I'm emphasizing the point that 
uh, this uh, final division here is only happening in the UART module. The rest of the computer it will be still running at whatever speed you uh, choose from that uh, clock rate selector. However, only for UART communication, we're going to basically dividing it again by 16. And that's going to give us the final speed for our UART communication. So in a nutshell, uh, with every speed that you select uh, on the computer, it always would be uh, divided by 16 uh, for your communication. Uh, the last uh, part is really the format or the structure of data that we are sending between these two devices. Now, uh, the key here is that when we are sending and receiving data between those two devices, there should be a way for these devices to detect when actually the data is sent and how to detect the beginning and end of a, let's say, data frame. And when we're talking about frame here is really frame is just our data that we're trying to send plus uh, some other bits, which let's say we could call them control bits here. So if you don't have a, a format or a structure when you're sending the data, there is no way for these you know, devices to, to be able to detect when actually the data starts and when it ends. I know that uh, they're running at the same speed, so at least they know at what uh, you know speed they should send the data. However, they have no idea when the data starts and when the data stops and so on. Essentially, if you don't have a structure here, uh, these devices um, are going to see a stream of bits that are coming on the line without uh, any um, you know point to uh, to see where is actually the data starting and where it, where it is ending. Therefore, let's uh, let's have a look at the example. Let's say that we are sending uh, character K or capital K from Bravo to that PC. I mean, first of all, with any UART communication, uh, when we are in ideal state and we are not sending or receiving anything on the line, the line will be kept high, and that's just by standard. Uh, so now you may ask why high and not uh, why not low? Well, essentially, when the, the the people who designed the UART uh, protocol at the time decided to set that line high in ideal state because uh, this way we would be actually to detect uh, if the other side is uh, live or not. Meaning that if we had that line low in the ideal and let's say that uh, we had a cut in the line and there was a disconnect between those two devices, there would be no way for these devices to detect that uh, actually the other side is down. However, by setting this line uh, to high in ideal state, then uh, these devices uh, would be able to check actually that the other side is still alive and it is still connected. So there is a connection between them. All right, so let's say that we have always uh, high as ideal. So when we try to send data, the first thing that we need to do is actually to bring the line low and that is called the start bit. So as soon as we bring the line low, we uh, essentially tell the other side that we're trying to send the data. And the first bit that actually follows that low uh, will be the first bit of data. So in this case, uh, to send the letter uh, K, uh, obviously the data is 8-bit, as you can see in the screen. Uh, and, the, and the least significant bit is actually zero. In UART communication, we are always sending the least significant bit first. So if the uh, direction here is from, let's say, Bravo to the computer, you see that the first bit that has been sent is actually the zero, which is the least significant bit in letter K. Uh, and then, uh, so the data is 8-bit. And then finally, once the data is sent, all the 8 bits are sent, we're going to have a stop bit. And the stop bit is basically just by uh, bringing the line high again. Now, you may think, OK, how the other side is not confusing that high bit with the high bit in the data. Well, the reason being is that we also have a predefined number of bits in serial communication. So for example, when we are sending and receiving data, we're going to tell both sides what is actually the length of the frame uh, that we are sending, meaning that in this case, in Bravo project, we have a length of 10, meaning that we have a start bit, we have an eight bits of data, and then we have a stop bit. So essentially, uh, we have a 10 uh, you know, continuous bits that are coming and that that's gonna represent uh, one byte. All right, so with that, uh, 
let's just have a look at the uh, Bravo project uh, serial communication specifications. So we talked about the speed um, by selecting that uh, clock uh, selector. We could output different speeds inside the Bravo and those speeds are going to translate to different baud rates, which um, again, we're going to look at the circuit, how that happens. Now the start bit is always one bit in Bravo, as you saw it, and the data bit always uh, is eight bit. And of course we have uh, one, uh, you know, stop bit at the end. So we uh, basically have 10 bits uh, in a frame when we're sending data in Bravo project. Now we have another uh, concept which is called a parity and parity could be actually another bit that could uh, basically come uh, right after data. And this is normally for an error detection in serial communications and it has its own story. And uh, since we are not using uh, parity in uh, serial communication in Bravo project, I'm not going to waste time on it, but if you're interested, there is a, a video on YouTube. Uh, it's called Understanding UART, and I'm going to put the a link into the description. You could watch that video, which basically goes uh, through, uh, you know, UART protocol and it talks also a little bit about the, uh, the parity. All right, so this is really all about the um, UART communication. Now, as the last slide, I also would like to emphasize that with serial communications, uh, we are actually sending um, the characters using, you know, their ASCII codes, meaning that each character, when we are sending and receiving uh, through serial communication through UART, uh, will be represented by its um, ASCII code value. So that means that let's say that we have a letter of E and letter E has a, let's say, 45 value in hex and um, let's say, uh, 100100 value in binary. So essentially when we are sending uh, capital D, we actually have to send this bits or the serial line so that the other side will understand that we are actually sending a capital D. So this is essentially a standard uh, in the communication. When the receiver receives this uh, sets of bits, then it knows that we are actually sending a, a capital D character. Uh, now, one challenge with this method is uh, uh, that the fact that we are actually sending the numbers in the same way and uh, the numbers will be a little bit challenging later because uh, they are not represented with the equivalent binary of the value of that number. Meaning that, uh, for example, uh, we are sending character zero here. And if you think about zero, zero uh, in binary actually will be um, all eight bits to zero. However, here, uh, this is actually represented as a character. Let's think about it as a um, text or a string. Therefore, we, uh, as you can see, we have a different uh, representation of character zero, which is, uh, you know, 0000110. So I hope that uh, this is not confusing here. Essentially, think about those as text or as, uh, you know, uh, characters rather than being a numbers here. And if you really want to do any uh, mathematic operation on these uh, characters, uh, first you need to convert those to, you know, equal uh, value in, in, let's say, decimal or in binary before doing the uh, mathematic operation. So with that, I guess we are done with the slides. I hope that it helped you guys a little bit in understanding UART. I tried to simplify uh, everything here. Now let's move on and have a look at the circuit behind our uh, TX or transmit module and see how it works. Um, essentially, we could divide uh, this circuit into two parts. Uh, one part is uh, simply a, a clock divider, which is managed uh, using a single uh, 74HC161 chip. And uh, we also have two other chips, which are 74HC165s uh, here on the right hand side, uh, which uh, are taking care of two things for us here. One would be uh, to convert uh, the parallel data into a serial uh, line. And also, uh, it's going to basically format the data for us. So uh, let's uh, have a closer look and see how this happens. Now, on the clock side, um, uh, as I mentioned in the slides, uh, the challenge was to basically reduce the uh, clock speed in the computer to a lower speed so that we could match it uh, with the standard UART um, baud rates, right? And this is uh, done here simply by using, you know, a 74HC161 
uh, which is a, a four bit binary counter. Uh, however, um, we have talked about this chip a lot uh, in, in the video series. And if you remember uh, from the uh, clock module uh, video, um, we actually talked about how to use this chip to um, divide the clock. So the same thing is uh, um, happening here. Essentially, uh, as you can see on the input side uh, on this chip, uh, D0 to D3, uh, all of them are tied to ground. And uh, we are not actually inputting anything into this chip. And uh, even if you look at the parallel in enable or parallel enable line, uh, this line is actually an active low line. However, we tied it to high. That means that we are not reading anything on the input side. So this chip uh, really uh, just will be a counting chip here for us. And as you can see, the pin number seven and 10, which are the uh, count enabled uh, pins are, and they are active high pins are actually tied to five volt. That means that this chip uh, will be counting if it receives a clock pulse on pin number two. So uh, the main clock line uh, from uh, Bravo comes to pin number two. And with each clock pulse, this chip will be counting from 0 to 16. Now, if you look at the output side, uh, you see that we are not actually outputting anything uh, from bit uh, 0, 1, and 2. Uh, we are only outputting uh, the, the clock from uh, the most significant bit here, uh, which is uh, pin number 11. So that means that with every 16 clock pulse that is coming to the chip uh, through pin number two, we are only outputting one clock pulse on uh, pin number 11. So that simply means that we are actually dividing the uh, clock by 16. And that's uh, basically where uh, we were talking about in the slides that we need a circuit to divide the uh, clock by 16 for our UART module. Now, if you have noticed, um, we also have the master reset line and this chip connected to some other lines. Uh, we're going to get into that in a minute. So just for now, uh, remember that this, this uh, you know, chip is just a clock divider. Now, the output of this uh, clock divider is essentially going to a pair of 74 HC165s, uh, which are essentially uh, the chips that uh, do the parallel uh, to serial conversion for us. Now, let's say how these chips work. Now, these chips, as you can see, have some uh, input lines from D0 to D7. And these are essentially uh, parallel to serial shift registers, uh, which means that uh, they will be putting the values of the input lines on a single output line. Uh, and also at the same time, they will be shifting the values to the most significant bit. So what does it mean? It basically means that when we have a value on the input side, with each clock pulse that the chip receives, it puts the value of D7, which is the most significant bit, onto Q7, which is the output lines. Essentially, this is the serial output line. So once uh, that value is set on Q7, then the whole data in the chip will be shift one to the left, meaning that the value of D6 will be moved to D7, the value of D5 will be moved to D6, and so on, all right? Also, as you can see, we have two chips here. So one chip is actually connected to bus lines from zero to five. Uh, and also another chip, which um, actually connected to uh, bus lines six and seven. However, if you look at the chip on the right hand side, the output of that chip, the serial output of that chip is actually cascaded to the uh, serial in of the chip on the left hand side. That means that when this chip is actually shifting the data, in fact, it's sending those value to the next chip in line, which is chip on the left. However, the real output uh, from both of those chips are actually going to show up on the uh, Q7 on the chip on the left hand side, which is connected to uh, our TX line or our send line. And I'm going to give you an example uh, shortly so that you can see actually how the whole thing works. 
But for now, I just wanted to mention that this is actually a shift register and also um, uh, basically a parallel to serial. So let's say that we have a value uh, on the bus and we want to uh, send that value in a serial fashion uh, through our TX line. So the first thing that we're going to do, obviously, we're going to set the value on the bus line. Now, if you have noticed here, you see that the D7 and D6 pins on, on this chip here is actually not connected to the bus, right? The D7 is connected to 5 volt directly, so that means high. The D6 is actually connected to ground. And then we are starting from D5 to um, actually uh, have the data lines um, connected. So these two bits are, in fact, our control bits um, uh, when we are trying to format the data. Uh, the D7 is actually high because this is the one bit before uh, basically sending the data or basically sending the start bit. And D6 here is, in fact, our start bit. So let's say that we set a value on the bus and now we're ready to send the data. And I'm going to talk about that, how that's going to happen uh, through the circuit here. But let's say that we're trying to send the, the, this data. So with the first clock pulse that's coming to the chip, this chip is actually going to put uh, the value of D6 on the output line of Q7. So that's the first bit, but this is high. So nothing's going to happen because high is high and uh, because by default, uh, the serial line is high, uh, that doesn't uh, specifically mean anything. However, this is important to have it here because that's going to be actually a, a byte separator between this byte and the next byte, which is coming in the line. All right. So let's assume that the first byte really doesn't do anything. However, it's just a high byte that we're sending. Now, with the second bit, once this has been shifted to D7, because again, remember, this is a shift register. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to basically shift the next byte to D7, which is a low line always. And once this shifted, then that byte will be put on the um, TX line. And that's actually signal the start bit, or basically tells uh, the other side, oh, we have a start bit here. So you should expect the data right after that bit. And as you can see, the next uh, bits uh, here are all data. So those, bi those uh, bits are shifted one by one to the you know, D7, and then it's going to be basically put on the TX line and sent at the clock speed that we have uh, agreed upon uh, for UART communication. The other thing that I have to mention here is the rest of the lines on the second chip, as you can see, are all tied to um, high. And that means that we are actually setting all of those to one. And this is, uh, this is okay because, as I mentioned before, when we are actually not sending and receiving and the line is um, ideal in serial communication, we want to just send ones. And that's why all of those lines uh, are set uh, to one. So basically, we're, we're not sending anything. We're just sending ones, which from a serial communication perspective, is just an uh, ideal line. Now, let's uh, focus on the control signals for, for the circuit. So we actually have a single um, TI signal, which we'll be using to uh, control our um, TX uh, communication here. And as you can see, uh, that TI signal, which is uh, coming uh, from our control logic, which we'll be talking about that later, uh, is combined with uh, the original clock uh, signal from our clock module. And what is happening here is that both of those signals are coming to a NAND gate here. And you know that the uh, output of the, a NAND gate will be low only when both of the inputs are high. Now, the clock signal is going high and low all the time, right? So uh, it all depends on the TI signal to actually uh, be able to activate um, this NAND gate and output a um, low signal here. Now, by default, uh, because the TI signal is low, no matter what happens to clock, if it goes high or low, uh, the output of uh, this circuit will always be high. Now, this signal is coming to a clock divider, and also it is also coming to 
parallel line input um, on these chips, which essentially controls uh, when these chips will be reading the um, input side from the bus. So now when this line is high, uh, it is connected to the master reset of this chip here. So that means that, uh, you know, the master reset on this chip is actually an active low signal. So if you wanted to reset the chip, we need to set it to low. So when this line is actually high by default, that means that we are not resetting this, this uh, uh, circuit here and this counter will be active and it will be counting all the time. And when it's counting all the time, because we still have not set any data on the bus and we have also these lines all connected to one, essentially all the input lines on these chips are set to one. And that means that these two chips also will be outputting one all the time on the TX line. Essentially, we just keep the TX line high without any data being on it. Also, if you look at it, this the same signal is actually coming to a parallel line on these two chips. And the parallel input line uh, on these chips are also an active low pin, meaning that when we actually want to read something from the bus, we actually need to bring this line low. However, by default, it's high. So these chips are not reading anything from the bus. They are just outputting one. Now, as soon as we bring the TI signal high, then the whole thing is going to change. So that means that when the TI signal is actually going high, on the next rising edge of the clock, this NAND gate will be outputting zero on the output side. So essentially brings the output low. And when this line goes low, a couple of things are going to happen. First, this chip will be resetting. So essentially when we say resetting, this chip actually will not be counting. I mean, it just stops sending you know, any clock pulse uh, on the output line. So the first thing that's going to happen is that just stop this chip uh, from counting. The next thing that's going to happen is that both of those parallel input lines and, and these two chips are going to go low. And that's what we need when we try to read the data from the bus. So essentially that goes low, that goes low, and at that moment, the data which is on the bus will be read in into those chips. But once the TI line goes down again, then again, this line will be high, so this chip will be counting again, and this time when it counts, because now we have data here, it will be actually sending out the data through TX line, and that's how we shift the data. But remember, when we're sending the data, we are, we are actually sending a high, we are sending a low as the start bit, and then we start sending the data. And then after sending the data, we all uh, we again bring the line high, which means that that's the stop bit for, for the data. So I hope that this is clear how the TX line works here. Now, you also have noticed that we have a capacitor here, which is a 100 picofarad capacitor. Uh, this capacitor is really just to uh, stabilize this line. Uh, during the uh, design of this uh, circuit by Carson, uh, it looks like that there has been some uh, instability in this line, especially when you have longer traces for these lines uh, at higher speeds. So essentially, uh, this capacitor here is just you know stabilizing the, uh, this line. So in general, if you actually think about the circuit, it's, it's quite interesting how the whole thing works, right? We have some sort of control mechanism here, uh, meaning that when we actually set the TI line high, uh, you know, this circuit will stop working and uh, basically allows the uh, 74 HC165s to read data from the bus and save it inside uh, the chips. And then when this line goes and uh, the TI line goes down, then again, this chip will start counting. And by counting, basically, that will be sending data out from the uh, TX line. All right, so with that, uh, I guess we are ready to go ahead and test the RX module. And it's pretty cool. We are going to send some data uh, from uh, Bravo uh, to, uh, to our PC. And we're going to actually, uh, for the first time, see the outputs of the uh, Bravo project on the computer screen. So let's go ahead and set it up and test it.
All right, so we built our UART module and it's ready for testing. Uh, as you can see, I have soldered the um, USB to serial adapter directly on the board. And however, uh, we have uh, you know these pins that are a little bit long and essentially it's uh, in the way of these uh, this specific capacitor. So as I have mentioned also in the soldering video, there are two solutions to that. One is uh, you know just uh, to cut short these pins or just like me, if you don't want to cut them, you could just uh, bend them so that they, uh, they don't block the, the capacitor. Um, again, in the newer versions of the board, uh, this capacitor is uh, actually a little bit further away uh, so that it's not, uh, and it's not in the way. Um, however, the, the goal here has been really to keep this uh, capacitor as close as possible to the 5 volt input uh, from the serial to, uh, serial to uh, USB. Now, uh, with that, uh, let's just mount it uh, into our Arduino Omega shield. And of course, we are going to do the LED board. Now, uh, if you have noticed, now we actually have um, two USB connections uh, here. One would be uh, to connect to the UART. Obviously, um, you want to you know, connect um, this board to our computer so that we could have uh, serial communication uh, with Bravo. We also had the Arduino Mega. So for uh, this video and the next video that we will be testing uh, the uh, UART module, we actually need uh, both of those USB connections to be connected. Uh, however, if you remember from the previous video, we were actually using the Arduino Mega uh, to power up the whole system using the USB port. Uh, however, here we also have another source of 5 volt supply that is coming from the USB to uh, serial adapter. So you may think how it is possible. Well, the good news is that uh, you know the Arduino Mega uh, has uh, basically a voltage regulator uh, that allows us to actually power it up to a different uh, power source, which in, in this case would be uh, this adapter. Therefore, um, as long as you have a 5 volt regulated um, uh, here and it's not exceeding five, five and a half, I believe. Uh, it is perfectly fine and it's safe for your uh, Arduino Mega to be powered up through a different source. So in fact, uh, in, in this video, we are gonna first connect the uh, you know uh, USB port to the serial to USB adapter. And that will basically uh, power up the whole unit, uh, including the uh, Arduino Mega. Uh, and also after that, we will be uh, connecting the, the USB port to the Arduino Mega. So in this case, uh, the Arduino Mega is already powered up. So essentially the USB port that you'll be connecting to Arduino Mega will be only for um, data exchange between uh, the computer when you are uploading or when you're running uh, the sketches and so on. So uh, just make sure that you first connect uh, the micro USB to the uh, serial adapter and then uh, you connect the USB port to the Arduino Mega. I guess that's that's really all about it so let's go ahead and have a look at the sketch and then we're gonna run some tests and we're gonna send actually data from uh, Bravo into the serial application in the computer. All right so let's uh, test the TX module. As you can see I have opened the Arduino uh, sketch on the left hand side of the screen and I have Teraterm open on the right hand side of the screen. So uh, Teraterm, as I mentioned before, is an open source uh, terminal emulator program. You can download it and install it on your PC and uh, you could make a terminal connection to Bravo. Now something uh, that is important here is that uh, we are actually connecting both the Arduino Mega Shield and also the um, USB to serial adapter here at the same time. And uh, if you uh, look at uh, my system, for example, you see that the uh, Arduino Mega is actually detected as uh, COM3 and uh, my Teraterm is actually connected to uh, COM6. So uh, those uh, COM ports uh, could be different on your system, depending on how your system detects the USB ports. But again, uh, I just wanted to mention that you need to have both uh, COM ports detected and be connected at this point of time. All right, so the Arduino sketch is actually quite simple. Uh, as you can see, these are the, just the general functions that we have talked about before. And um, 
we really have uh, three functions here that uh, we need to test our TX module. So the first one is ba just basically the uh, setup uh, function and we have two more. Now, as you can see, we have the delay timer again set to 10 millisecond here. Uh, we use that delay timer to just generate a small delay between different operations. Now inside the uh, setup function, uh, at the first step, I'm resetting basically all the pins on Arduino and set everything back to default. And then as you can see uh, for this sketch, I'm using a new function uh, called tone. Tone is a standard Arduino function. And in fact, if you look at the documentation, which are here, uh, you see that it says that uh, the tone function generates a square wave of the specified frequency on a pin. So this is great uh, because this is uh, what we need. We just need to uh, have uh, a clock pulse running on one of our pins and that's gonna uh, do it for us. So let's go back to the sketch and see uh, what how we could use this function. So uh, if you uh, look at uh, this line, you see that I have the tone function and I'm passing a pin and also a frequency. Now the clock pin uh, uh, is the same pin that we have been using uh, for clock pulses in, in the previous uh, sketches. And I guess uh, you should be familiar with that uh, pin by now. This is actually pin number two in uh, our Arduino Mega defined as clock. And in the previous sketches, we were using a function called uh, pulse the clock or a clock pulse something like that that what we were doing we we're just basically doing a, a digital right high and then we waited for a delay and then digital right low so this way we were uh, kind of creating a clock pulse uh, however here as you can see I'm replacing the function with the uh, tone function and the reason being is that uh, we need a little bit higher speeds here uh, on our uh, uh, clock pulses Essentially, uh, because we need to match the baud rate for the serial communication, uh, we need a little bit higher uh, uh, clock speeds here. And using those digital right high and low uh, couldn't give us uh, that high speed that we need here. Uh, all of those are, you know, functions that are running in the background and basically just, you know, uh, takes a lot of time to be executed. So the best way to implement that is really to use the tone function. Now, as you can see, once you uh, you know, specify the pin and a frequency from that moment, the, uh, this pin actually will be outputting a clock pulse at that speed. And speed here is 38,400. That means that we are actually uh, generating 38,400 clock pulse uh, per second. Now, the clock pin uh, is essentially connected, obviously, to all the clock pins inside Bravo. So when we are sending this this clock pulses it's going to be received by all modules including our uh, uart module however something important here to mention is that uh, remember this is the main clock pulse that is coming to uart module if you remember from the uh, uh, circuit uh, this is actually uh, this clock pulse that's coming into uh, the clock divider so uh, that means that uh, that clock actually is divided by uh, 16 uh, when uh, it reaches our uh, parallel to uh, serial inverters or converter uh, chips. So therefore we have to actually divide that by 16 and that's going to give us the baud rate. So in fact, if you look at my uh, setup and that's how you uh, basically, uh, you know, make changes in the setup of your Terraterm, you go to serial port. And as you can see, uh, these are all the parameters that we talked about uh, for serial communication when uh, we were looking at the slides. Uh, and as you can see, uh, for example, this is connected to um, COM6 port and the baud rate, uh, as you can see, is uh, 2400, which means that we have actually divided this uh, clock pulse by 16. And then uh, the data, as you can see, is 8 bits and uh, the stop bit is actually 1 bit and we are not using any parity. Now, if you have noticed here, uh, there is no uh, settings for the start bit. And uh, that's because start bits uh, will be always one bit. So obviously we cannot change that, but uh, you know, you could uh, change the rest of the configuration here and set it to your specification uh, that you need. Now, this line is uh, really all about uh, generating that uh, clock pulse at uh, high speed and, uh, and that's gonna be continuously running on our clock pin. 
Now, uh, the next line is really just set the bus pins to output because we would like to actually write some data to those bus pins. And uh, finally, we have a transmit call or a call to a function called transmit that you can see here. And we specify a value or we pass a value into it. Now, looking at the uh, transmit function, you say that um, uh, basically we get that value that we are passing to it and we writing that to the bus. And I guess uh, write to bus function should be uh, quite familiar by now. Yeah, this is essentially the function that uh, you know takes any value and uh, convert it to bits and then write the bits on bus lines one by one and then you know shift the uh, bits to the left and repeat the same process until all the bits are actually set on the uh, bus lines. So we get that value, we write it on the bus. And as you can see, it's quite simple. The only thing that we need to do at this point is really to do a digital write on the TI signal. Uh, we make it high and then we wait for a short delay. And then uh, again, we bring that line down. So if you go back to the uh, circuit, you remember that we had a TI signal and that's uh, what we do. We just, you know, take that high. Uh, and then uh, once we did that, you know, the data on the bus will be uh, written into uh, these uh, two chips. And then once we bring it down, uh, then it will uh, start sending those bits uh, one by one on the on the serial line. So I guess we are ready to run the sketch now. And as you can see, I'm just passing the value of 65 uh, to the transmit function. And the value of 65 is in fact uh, capital character A. So going back to the ASCII table, uh, if you look at uh, capital A, you see that I actually have a value of uh, 65 in decimal and that's what we are passing so the expectation here is that uh, the the value 65 is actually sent to a transmit function and uh, we uh, should see character a or capital a uh, on the screen so let's uh, let's check this sketch and upload it and see uh, what will happen all right as you can see we have a uh, character a printed on the screen all right, so looks good. Now, maybe we could just do a little bit more here. So let's uh, let's create another function here. Maybe we could call it uh, test transmit, and we could basically just uh, maybe we could do a for loop inside here. So let's say for you know integer i equal to let's say zero and then we could just say i less than let's say 50 and then we could do you know i plus equal to a one we're adding one and then we just need to you know move this transmit function there and maybe here we could just say test transmit rather than. So what I'm trying to do is uh, essentially just create a loop inside another function so that we, you know, print this character multiple times on the screen. So uh, test transmit is going to go from zero to, let's say 50, and then it's going to, you know, uh, transmit or call the transmit function each time and send the uh, value of 65. So let's see. Let's see how this works. So, well, it didn't print 50 times. So let's see what's going on here. Um, I think we may need a delay here because otherwise we will be setting those values too fast on the bus. So let's just give it another shot. Yep. So what is happening here is that uh, inside this, uh, you know, uh, test transmit function that we created here, we are writing, uh, you know, the value uh, 50 times. But if you don't have a delay, we are writing that so fast back to back that eventually, uh, you know, there will not be enough time for the, uh, you know, TI signal to, to read it every time. Uh, and basically what is happening is it's just read it one time from the bus. So by creating a little delay here, we give it enough time to actually that uh, value to be written and then uh, read uh, by the uh, UART module, URTX module, and then basically uh, again, loop back to the beginning and so on. So that delay is important here. You gotta have a delay. Now, um, 
let's do another thing. Let's say, uh, well, if you look at the uh, table, you notice that every uh, character here um, has a uh, corresponding value, right? So, but if you if you look at it, there are also some values for other uh, functions or other, let's say, keys such as let's say uh, delete or tap key or uh, enter key and so on. So uh, the alphanumeric characters are actually starting from value decimal value of 32, and looks like it's going all the way up to a value of 126. Right, so if you actually want to print uh, the uh, alphanumeric uh, characters on the screen, uh, we could just send uh, uh, all these values uh, to our transmit uh, function. So let's do that. Let's uh, let's go back to this uh, function, and instead of going from zero, we could set the uh, initial value to 33, and then we could say go to all the way to 126. And each time, you know, uh, move up one. And then instead of just uh, sending a static value here at 65, uh, we could just, you know, send i, right? So this way, uh, each time we send a different character to be printed on the screen. All right, so let me just, uh, you know, clear the screen here and see what will happen. Let's check that. Hopefully I did save it. Uh, let me just save it, actually save, check, and then let's just... Uh, send it. All right, as you can see now, we are actually sending different characters, and all the alphanumeric characters are actually printed on this screen. All right, that's awesome. All right, uh, something else that I have to mention here is that if you um, actually look at our uh, LED board, um, you see here that uh, we don't uh, have a uh, LED for TI signal. Now remember that uh, that TI signal was in our uh, TX module and uh, there is no uh, LED for it. However, if you uh, look closely here, you see that we actually have a TR uh, signal here on LED board. And this is because um, both the uh, transmit and receive signals are somehow combined uh, in uh, um, Bravo. And we're going to talk about that in more details once we are in the uh, control logic later, but uh, we don't have a, a direct line to control the TI, uh, so that is actually a composite uh, signal that, again, as I said, we're going to talk about it. So when we are actually, uh, you know, changing that signal, uh, you see that there are no LEDs uh, here for it, so we're not going to be able to see anything. However, you can see the, the values when they are actually changing on the uh, bus lines. And as you can see, the, the clock is actually running. So that means that uh, we have an active clock on the clock pin. So uh, let me just uh, run it one more time and pay attention to the LEDs. And you see that uh, those values are actually moving on the bus. And though it's moving pretty fast, but you could obviously change this uh, timer here and let's say make it a little bit longer. So let's say make it one second and I'll kind of repeat the same thing here. And as you can see now, we are actually printing uh, or sending those uh, uh, characters, the data, um, uh, one second per character. So we see that it's kind of slower. And then now you could see actually the, the values are changing on the bus lines. All right, I guess uh, that's really all about the uh, TX module. Uh, I guess it was uh, quite easy and simple to test it. Uh, now, in next video, we'll be talking about the RX module, which is a little bit more involved. And uh, there, we actually will be typing on the uh, serial uh, emulator program here in Terraform. We'll be typing something, and that uh, data or character will be uh, transferred to Bravo. We are kind of doing the opposite of what we are doing here. All right, with that, I hope that uh, you guys have enjoyed this video. Um, I will see you uh, in next video.